October 17th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with Hamas's latest attack on Israel. Hamas claims that it fired a barrage of missiles at Tel Aviv and Jerusalem on the 10th day of the war. Humanitarian aid is stuck at the Gaza-Egypt border, with the Rafah crossing from Gaza to Egypt still shut down. North Korea reiterated at the UN that the regime will not abandon its nuclear weapons, saying Pyongyang continues to face threats from the United States. The Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, Seoul Adex 2023, kicks off on its largest ever scale. South Korea's homegrown KF-21 Porame fighter jet made its public debut ahead of the event. On Monday, Hamas fired rockets against Israeli cities of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who is on his second Israel trip, had to take shelter during his meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister. Shin Sebyeok starts us off. The cities of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv were under fire on Monday. Rocket alert sirens went off and blasts were heard across the cities. Palestinian militant group Hamas said it fired a barrage of missiles at the cities in response to what it called Israel's targeting of civilians. According to the Washington Post, at least 1,400 people have been killed and over 4,000 injured in Israel, while nearly 2,800 people have been killed and nearly 10,000 wounded in Gaza since a surprise attack by Hamas on Israel sparked new fighting in the region on October 7th. Also on Monday, people gathered at the Rafah crossing on the Gaza-Egypt border, following reports that it would be reopened during a brief ceasefire. The crossing has been shut for security reasons since Hamas took control of Gaza in 2007. If the border were to open, Gazans with dual citizenship could leave the territory and humanitarian aid now waiting on the Egyptian side could enter. However, both Israel and Hamas have denied reports of reopening, exacerbating an already desperate humanitarian crisis. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israeli War Cabinet members in Tel Aviv on Monday. There, Blinken reaffirmed firm support from the U.S. for Israel. It is the U.S. official's second visit to Israel in under a week. A State Department spokesperson said the meeting was briefly interrupted by air raid sirens, forcing Blinken and Netanyahu to take shelter in a bunker for five minutes. In a speech to Israel's parliament on Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned Iran and the Lebanese Hezbollah terror group to stay out of the conflict in the north. I have a message to Iran and Hezbollah. Don't test us on the northern border. Iran-backed Hezbollah has ramped up missile and rocket attacks in northern Israel's border area with Lebanon in the past days. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. North Korea has reaffirmed its long-held usual stance at the UN that Pyongyang will not let go of its nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Harry Harris called for strengthened nuclear deterrence for South Korea amid threats from the North. Lee seung has more. During the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly meeting on Monday, North Korea's secretary for North Korea's permanent mission to the United Nations, Kim in Char, said Pyongyang will not give up its nuclear weapons as it faces continuous threats from the United States. Kim said that the U.S. continues to deploy nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula, which are disguised with claims of being defensive in nature. He also added that the U.S. continues to conduct nuclear weapons tests despite its condemnation of North Korea's nuclear ambitions and has been accelerating a nuclear arms race. Both Seoul and Tokyo condemned Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, calling for the North to give up its nuclear weapons and return to dialogue. Meanwhile, former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Harry Harris during a virtual seminar called for the U.S. to keep strengthening its extended deterrence commitment to South Korea as he stressed that North Korea's evolving military threats are far greater than before. Harris said that the North has been doubling down on its nuclear and missile programs under an aggressive nuclear policy stipulated in its constitution. However, the former ambassador said it would be a mistake to redeploy U.S. tactical nuclear arms to the Korean Peninsula. 
Harris, who served from 2018 to 2021, also raised concerns about technological cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. Lee seung Arirang News. Russian ships linked to military transport networks have reportedly been traveling to and from North Korea since August. Citing satellite images, the Washington Post on Monday said two ships with no previous record of moving between Russia and North Korea had begun making trips in August when Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un met for talks. The satellite imagery analyzed by London-based Royal United Services Institute showed the two ships making at least five round trips beginning mid-August through Saturday. Washington earlier this week said that Russia has moved around 1,000 containers, which could potentially hold hundreds of thousands of weapons that could be used in the war in Ukraine. The third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation kicks off today in Beijing as China seeks to expand its leadership on the global stage amid its rivalry with the U.S. During the two-day event, President Xi will deliver an opening speech as the event marks the 10th anniversary of its key One Belt, One Road initiative, which aims to bolster economic cooperation along the land and sea routes from China to Central Asia and Europe. Some 140 countries are expected to participate with eyes of a possible summit between President Xi and his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. That will be their second face-to-face -face this year, with their solidarity against the U.S. likely to take center stage of their discussions, which could also entail a message on the Israel-Hamas conflict. <laughs> One of Northeast Asia's largest aerospace and defense exhibitions, Saur Adex 2023, kicks off in the coming hour. Now, hopes are high that this year's event will be a stepping stone for South Korea to be seen as a leading global arms exporter. Our defense correspondent, Choi Min Jung, has a preview. South Korea's first homegrown supersonic fighter jet, the KF-21, soars above Seoul Air Base. It's being revealed to the public for the very first time at the biennial Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, taking place from Tuesday to Sunday. This year's exhibition is the largest so far, with some 550 entities from 35 countries taking part. Spectators can get a rare up-close look at the country's latest military equipment, such as the F-35A stealth fighter jets and the F-A-50 light attack aircraft. Also on display is the country's main battle tank, the K-2 Black Panther, which shot to fame when Poland struck a deal to purchase 1,000 of them last year. And to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Seoul-Washington alliance this year, the U.S. has boosted its display of military power. Yes, the B-52 will conduct uh, one to two flybys of Seoul Airfield during Seoul ADEX. U.S. strategic bomber the B-52 is making an appearance as it is making a rare landing at a South Korean airbase this week. Also one of the key U.S. assets on display is the F-22 Raptor, known as the world's most powerful fighter jet. Seoul 8X has been growing in size with every addition, with Korea looking to become one of the world's top four defense export countries. It's also striving to become one of the world's top air shows. We'll do our best to make Seoul ADEX, which will be held again in 2025, one of the world's top three air shows. Taking this as an opportunity to promote the country's advanced military and space technologies overseas, South Korea has invited senior-level military officials and delegations from 53 countries. The exhibition was first launched in 1996 to promote domestic defense firms and boost global technology exchanges. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. So South Korea is aiming to become one of the world's top four defense export countries by 2027. How reliable is this ambitious goal? Let's discuss more with Professor Kim Jimmo this morning. Welcome to the program. My pleasure to be with you today. Professor Kim, I'd like to start with South Korea's homegrown KF-21 Porame fighter jet. Now, it made its public debut yesterday. What makes this fighter jet so exceptional? Uh, among defense products, fighter jets are one of the most sophisticated items, and only six to seven countries can make their own fighter jets for their own uh, demands and for export markets. In that sense, 
uh, it itself is a, a milestone. And secondly, uh, fighter jets work as a platform for further development of weapons. For example, uh, so-called multi man unmanned uh, teaming technology can be developed from this platform, which means uh, pilots in this plane can uh, control uh, multiple unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, to multiply their, their performance. Thirdly, uh, this is a combination of uh, state-of-the-art technologies into one body. So it's a great milestone for the Korean uh, aerospace industry. Indeed, and it's not just KF-21, Porame, over 100 other weapon systems will be on display starting today for the next six days. Now, how far, Professor Kim, would you say South Korea's military weapons and development has come so far? Uh, Korea's defense industry has almost 50-year history since uh, mid-1970s. Uh, with the increasing threat from the north, it has been the answer uh, to that challenge, challenges. And as a consequence today, K-9 Hoichir, for example, takes almost 50% of the world uh, export market. K-2 main battle tanks are ordered more than 900 units by Poland last year. And F-A-50 fighter jets and uh, T-50 trainer series are used in many countries. And recent orders include 48 fighters ordered by Poland, 18 by Malaysia, and orders are expected to come in other countries. And also, um, this plan can be a bridge to, to assure KF-21 Porame into uh, international market in the next decade. Right, and it's and also the key U.S. military assets like the strategic B-52 bomber and uh, the F-22 Raptor shelf jet are also making their presence known in SARS skies. How significant would you say it is? Um, in the 21st century uh, war environment, uh, almost no country can wage a war alone. Mm. Uh, that means. Uh, having alliance is quite important and pivotal. And in that sense, U.S.-Korea alliance has played a great role, mm. pivotal role in maintaining regional as well as global peace. And this uh, this patch of aircraft symbolizes this alliance. Also, it evidence that U.S. policy of extended deterrence, because in the sense that uh, in times of war, uh, U.S. military assets, including this aircraft, aircraft types, should be used to to uh, project the extended deterrence policy, and that's the the importance of this uh, deployment. Right, the event does come at a timely manner, considering the 70th anniversary of Seoul Washington Alliance. Let's also talk about South Korea's goal of reaching 20 billion U.S. dollars in defense exports this year. We only are two months away from the end of 2023. How achievable is this target? I mean, is 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 there enough demand? Um, <clears throat> Forecasting the the uh, export volume, especially defense products, is not that easy because the nature of the defense deals takes time, and it's volatile against the international environment. Yet, uh, we still have promising uh, out outlook mm. uh, with several reasons. First, um, a lot of countries are faced with um, un instability in regional and global issues. And that means they need to upgrade their uh, arsenals. And second, to meet that demand, um, they should find uh, where to source uh, their, their weapons. And not many countries are maintaining large-scale production of armed spaces like Korea. So that's the promising uh, factor. And thirdly, Korean weapon systems are uh, cost-effective. And that means buyer countries can uh, enjoy so-called defense economics with the same budget they can buy more. And also the quality of Korean products are quite uh, superb these days. So uh, with this 
backgrounds, uh, the export goals uh, can be attained uh, optimistically, I think. Sure, the goal is indeed challenging, but indeed also achievable in the near future. And then uh, before I let you go, Professor Game, why is it important that this event, SAR ADAX, continues to take place? Uh, ADEX 2023 is a venue where a different uh, group of audience meet, uh, share information, exchange ideas, hmm. participate in marketing activities, and also we have uh, public relations roles in this event. Uh, since the first uh, ADEX venue in 1996, uh, in, this, in this sense, this event has contributed not only to defense industry promotion, but also to public relations role to Korean people. Uh, in, in this uh, context, if this, con this event continues, of course, it will grow up to one of the major three or two um, exhibition in the world, mm -hmm. like Paris Air Show and Dubai Air Show. And, and that gives us uh, more incentives mm. to promote this event. Definitely. All right, Professor Kim Juma, thank you so much for your insight this morning. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed it. The Chinese city Hangzhou, where the Asian Games recently came to a close, means more than just sports for Korea. It's where Korean independence fighters found a new beginning by relocating the provisional government after facing tough times in Shanghai. Our culture correspondent Song Yujin went there and filed his report. Hangzhou, the host of the largest ever Asian Games, holds a special place in Korea's heart beyond the medals and records. Right next to the famous Shihu or West Lake in Hangzhou, you'll find the Memorial Hall of the Korean Provisional Government. So originally there were three Korean Provisional Government buildings here in the city of Hangzhou, but this is the only one that's left. So as you can see, this building, it was originally used by government officials until 1934, but now it's used as an exhibition hall. Open to the public since 2007, the Memorial Hall has two main sections, a recreation of the rooms used by the government and an exhibition hall that tells the story of the Korean provisional government's 27-year struggle for independence. The Korean provisional government was set up in 1919 in Shanghai after the March 1st independence movement. However, it had to relocate after independence activist Yun Bong-gil set off a bomb in Shanghai's Hongkou Park in 1932 that killed several high-ranking Japanese military officials. Fleeing from Japan's invasion of Shanghai, the Korean provisional government found refuge at an inn in Hangzhou in 1932. But due to budget constraints, they later moved their headquarters here to Hubian Village a year later. This two-story building served as both a home and a workplace for government officials. Records show that they stayed in Hubian until November 1934 before moving to their third and final headquarters in Hangzhou, Wufuli. The memorial's director says the three and a half years in Hangzhou were a crucial turning point for the Korean provisional government. It was during this period when Kim Gu, one of the founding members of the government, secretly met with then-Chinese leader Jiang Jieshi, where Jiang pledged to fund Korean independence fighters. Kim also established the Korean National Party, which united various scattered groups of independence activists. So, for those who want to step back in time and take a look at this history, the hall is open every day from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., free of charge. Song Yujin, Arirang News, Hangzhou. Good morning, I'm Matthew Ashley, and we now turn over to stories from around the world. We begin in the Belgian capital, Brussels, where two Swedish citizens have been killed in a shooting by a gunman still 
at large. Now, the incident occurred on Monday evening ahead of a football match between Belgium and Sweden. The Euro 2024 qualifying match was abandoned at half-time over security concerns, with the score at 1-1. The shooting is being considered an act of terrorism, and terror alert levels have been raised to their highest. On social media, a man claiming to be from Islamic State took responsibility for the fatal attack and claimed to have killed three people. The attack comes amid heightened security concerns in Europe linked to the Israel-Hamas conflict. Now, former Finnish president and Nobel Peace Prize winner Marti Atisari died on Monday, aged 86. He had retired from public life in September last year after being diagnosed with advanced Alzheimer's. Atisari was president of Finland for one term from 1994 to 2000. During that time, he oversaw the national referendum to join the European Union, and in 2008 he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in resolving international conflicts. Atisari was born in 1937 in the former Finnish town of Vipuri, which is now the Russian town of Vyborg. He was a primary school teacher before going into politics in 1965 and spent more than two decades working for the Finnish Foreign Ministry in Tanzania, Zambia and at the United Nations. This achievement has only been possible. Now in sports news, cricket, flag, uh, football, squash, lacrosse, baseball and softball, these are all set to become Olympic sports. Voting by the International Olympic Committee on Monday resulted in 88 of 90 members in favour of adding the five sports to the 2028 Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles. The decision at the meeting in Mumbai, India, means that flag football will be seen at the international event for the very first time. The sport is a variant of American football, where a flag or flag belt from a ball carrier must be removed to end a down instead of using tackles. Cricket, meanwhile, makes a return for the first time since 1900. And finally, dog owners in the Peruvian capital Lima dressed their pets up on Sunday to take part in an annual Halloween costume contest. A panel of judges evaluated the four-legged contestants' costumes on creativity, originality, family involvement and runway performance. Top prizes this year were awarded for Hollywood-inspired costumes such as Wednesday from The Addams Family and Willy Wonka from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The contest is meant to promote responsible ownership and pet adoption. Good morning. While the air is getting colder, the days are becoming shorter. Many parts of Korea woke up to the chilliest morning weather of the season so far. Morning temperatures in most parts are 2 to 7 degrees, lower than the same time yesterday with thick fog in inland areas. Craving hot soup weather for sure this morning. Then afternoon highs will hike fast, allowing plenty of autumn sunshine into the 20s. Take your vitamins and a balanced meal to stay healthy. Many are coming down with a cold around this time. We had a chilly start, but a pleasant afternoon ahead as long as you dress in layers. Highs in most parts will be in the low 20s this afternoon. Rain is in the forecast at the end of the week. Then, that band of rain will bring a short winter vibe to the country this weekend. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. <music> We thank you for watching New Day and Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.
한국에 오면 먹어야죠. 먹어도 먹어도 끝이 없는 나라. 감당할 수 있겠니? 엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 웰컴 24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 나라, 감당할 수 있겠니? 코리아 and the world, Arirang Radio. It's our 20th anniversary of our station. For you, wherever you may be, and for 20 years like a friend, as a messenger, and as a partner. We have shared countless happy memories, and this might just be another beginning. As you've done for the past 20 years, And for the next 20 to come, join us on Arirang Radio. Always Korea, always Arirang Radio. Lotte takes a new leap beyond its boundaries. Our change will lead to better lives for all. New Lotte, the power of a better world. New today, better tomorrow. Lotte. Welcome. 엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 하나, 둘, 셋! Hey, Mr. Pippin, to the floor. Make sure you listen to what I say. 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 
UK New Type News. New insights, new styles, and new topics every day. We are News Generation. Making news just for you. It's October 17th here in Seoul, and I'm Shin Yeun, and you're watching News Generation, where we discuss the latest issues concerning our generation. Joining me in the studio is Jessica Dainal. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Happy Tuesday, and Park Ki-hoon. Thank you for having me. Now, both are here to speak on behalf of people in their 20s and 30s and share their own insights. As usual, let's start with our news feed, which covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending on social media over the past 24 hours. Starting next year, eye drops might no longer be covered by Korea's health insurance. Until now, people were able to buy eye drops at 10% of the original price, but from next year, people who haven't been diagnosed with a specific eye disorder will have to pay full price. That includes those who wear contacts regularly or have had LASIK surgery. A final decision will be made this December. And over the weekend, a South Korean military aircraft safely brought back citizens and foreign nationals from Israel. The transport plane on Saturday departed from an airport in Tel Aviv, carrying 163 South Koreans, 6 Singaporeans, and 51 Japanese nationals free of charge. Japan's top diplomat and public has since thanked Seoul's foreign ministry. At the same time, the Japanese public has questioned why their own government has just now sent their own transport plane, which carried only eight nationals back home. But each had to pay around 30,000 yen, which is around $200 to ride the plane. And it's almost one year since the Ito and Crush tragedy last Halloween. A total of 159 people who went out to the narrow alleyways of Seoul's Ito and neighborhood died. Most were in their 20s. And recently, officials found out that more than 1,300 firefighters were going through counseling or therapy sessions after being traumatized. Now, most were traumatized by the fact that they felt they didn't do enough or didn't arrive at the scene early enough to save more lives. Since the tragedy last year, many have been suffering with anxiety and going through sleepless nights. And the fire department has been providing trauma treatment for firefighters. By the year 2025, they're also thinking of opening a hospital dedicated just for firefighters firefighters. And trauma, it's definitely something one cannot overcome overnight. So what did you think about this news story in particular, ki mm, It's so sad and unfortunate that Korea had to go through this kind of tragic event um, mm -hmm. in this day and age. I think the media didn't focus too much on the firefighters, mm -hmm. even though they tried so hard to save every single life. And um, they were actually rather blamed for their lack of yeah. promptness, and they were questioning their capabilities mm -hmm. of being, you know, firefighters. As much as it's hard for the bereaved families, I think firefighters who were actually at the scene would have equally gone through a tough time. Absolutely. And we never really thought about the suffering they had to go through uh, ever since that tragic event up right. until today. Mm -hmm. So I think we all know um, they did everything they could, so we should support them, um, help them uh, to overcome their traumas mm -hmm. so that uh, they will continue to serve our country and hopefully to prevent any of these awful um, accidents from ever happening again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What was really disheartening for me as well when I read relevant comments on this news story was that some people were saying, if you're a firefighter, you should be mentally strong enough mm -hmm. to that's go so through that. True. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. Trauma doesn't have to do with whether you're strong or not. Right. Once you have an incident, it just enclaves in your head for mm -hmm. years and years, which requires a lot of counseling. Right. Absolutely. What was your thought on this story? I absolutely agree with you, Yen, and I'm so glad that there will be a hospital dedicated, hopefully, mm. to trauma patients because, let's face it, PTSD is a very serious and dire issue mm. for many, many workers on the front line of these emergency happenings. We're talking about not just firefighters, but even surgeons. Yeah. They go through a lot when they lose a patient. Or like war veterans, you know, people who are really putting their lives mm. to save our lives should be the first and foremost, you know, patients to be treated so that they can really become a protection and actually do the job right. that they are supposed mm -hmm. to do. So I really hope that the government dedicates more resources, not just for this Itaewon crisis, but for everyone who is putting their lives out there to make sure that we sleep very safely at night. I totally agree. South Korea does have its own trauma treatment center, mm -hmm. given that post-traumatic stress disorder is such an ongoing and pressing issue. But as you mentioned, if they specify it for different occupations, yes, absolutely. and not just limit it to a specific incident, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And that was our news feed for this Tuesday. Let's switch gears to our main discussion topic of the day now. You may have heard about the concept of well-being, but what about well-dying? To find out what it is, take a look at the screen. The longer our life expectancy has become, the more attention we've turned to the concept of well-dying. Just as its name suggests, well-dying is similar to well-being. 
Instead of promoting ways to better live life, while dying navigates ways for people to better prepare for death. Surprisingly, this concept is more popular among millennials and Gen Z rather than seniors. Experts believe this mainly has to do with social media. Social media places tragedy at our fingertips, which in turn makes discussions related to death ubiquitous. So yesterday on News Chen, we talked about kodoksa, which in Korean means dying alone, and we've decided to expand on that concept and dig a bit deeper into how our generation views death, more specifically, good death. Now, this seems to be another top issue among our generation. So, Cheska, could you first tell us the concept of well dying and how it surfaced among our generation? Absolutely. And before I start, I have a fun little question. Okay. Okay, if I tell you death, Mm -hmm. What is the first thought that comes into your mind? Or facial expressions in Kiyo's case? Because he looks like he's about to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my mommy. <laughs> So I'm guessing not a positive emotion for you. Not either. really. <laughs> but same here, I'm, I'm afraid of it. I think, you know, death has, you know, long been associated with obviously negative connotation. Mm. It's frightening, it's very unknown. But before we get worrisome, well dying is actually more about a mentality and actions that young people are taking nowadays to accept, appreciate, and even embrace this eventuality of death, hopefully far down the future. And as ki and I will elaborate mm -hmm. a little bit later, this is almost a very proactive approach to sort of understand and embrace the eventual mortality of our lives. And, you know, people actually trying to die well so that it translates into having a beautiful and more positive impact during the lives that they have. Mm. Right. Mm. And this concept of well dying has actually opened up a new market, I hear, ki -hun. So I hear some places are trying, allowing people to trial run their own death and mm. even funerals. Could you elaborate a bit more? Mm, definitely. As much as the term uh, well dying, like it sounds very interesting, mm. many youngsters actually pay money to experience their own death and funeral. Yes. And just like what Cheska mentioned, it actually has a positive impact Mm -hmm. on their lives. Um, a few years back, many millennials um, gave up on many things like uh, being in a relationship, uh, getting married, and buying their own house because of the economic downturn. So uh, instead, they turned to taking portrait photos because of their own funeral uh, down the track mm -hmm. because they didn't have too much to look forward to. But uh -huh. ironically, the whole process really helped them to look back on their own yeah. lives mm -hmm. and really appreciate like what really mattered the most and what they should do uh, about living a better life moving forward until death. Right. So a lot of photo studios were in business because of yes. this kind of trend mm. back then. And secondly, the excessive use of social media um, where anyone can see disturbing videos of people getting mm. killed in wars, um, even people getting stabbed in the yeah. street during daylight. I think many youngsters um, realize that death could happen to them anywhere at right. any time. So <laughs> they wanted to kind of uh, be ready for prepare. any kind of like yeah. prepare for any kind of you mm -hmm. know tragic event. So after doing the trial run of their own funeral, they would actually end up selling unnecessary items <laughs> to live a minimal life, yep. and mm -hmm. even apply to be an organ do organ donor. Ah. And write their last will at a very young age, yes. and and all these little steps has helped them to live a better life and prepare for a better death, mm. because that's a quite a new term for us. But right. they're doing that now, and obviously we can say that many I think social economic factors have really changed the behaviors of a lot of millennials and Gen Zs these days. Right. Yeah. So I guess the key concept of well dying is better preparing yourself so, for yeah. the deathbed. Mm -hmm. And Cheska, I hear you've actually tried this out yourself, right? Yes, I am one of those that Kiwan mentioned that actually paid the money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do a trial run for what it's like to have a, a sort of death experience. And I can tell you and everyone that's watching that for me personally, it was one of the most splendid and amazing experience that I've had. Um, first, I went through the stages of taking the portrait, um, writing my own will, which I brought with me, um, and uh, also wearing a shroud, which is a garment that you wear before you go into the coffin. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the interesting things that our instructor told us about the shroud is the shroud does not have any pockets, meaning when you die, mm. you do not take anything with you. And when we were writing our will and thinking about the lives that we had, I came to realize that I was 
very much at peace rather than being fearful and frightened as I thought I would be when I wasn't as close to the, the concept of death as I was. And it, when I got out of the experience, I had this you know, very silent moment to just think about what kind of life I have lived so far and what kind of life I want to live because there's an eventual death that is coming. And for me, it was an incredibly positive experience. And I actually tried it, not because I was having you know, a, a, you know, a life crisis or depression, but I really did it because I wanted to take the opportunity to make sure that I was on the right path mm. in this life. Like, am I rerouting my values correctly? Am I treating the people that I love with um, you know, care and integrity? And I think this experience was something that just opened my eyes to a whole lot of things. And what I'm curious about is, when you were there, mm -hmm. uh, on, on the screen we saw a lot of people in their 50s and 60s yes. try it out, but I hear that a lot of millennials and Gen Z youth yeah. are also doing it. Did you see a lot of people in their 20s and 30s join you? It's very, it's very interesting that you said it because when I was doing it, there were two groups that came together. Mm -hmm. And one was the church group with the, mm -hmm. the 40s and a little elderly people. And there was a youth group that came. Yeah. They were in their sort of, I guess, late teens. I I see. Yeah, and they were just as invested and as serious about the experience as exactly. anybody else was. Yeah. As Kuhn elaborated before, mm -hmm. not only is social media allowing us to see death on our fingertips, mm -hmm. I also think our generation is much more keen and attentive towards the concept of death. Very much so, so could you also elaborate on why you think our generation is so fixated on this concept of well dying then? It's a very interesting question. Um, I think, you know, we have gone through a lot in terms of COVID mm -hmm. and, you know, COVID was something that hit us when we were completely unprepared. But I would like to also add on top of that, and I say this with you know a lot of gratitude and almost caution, I think we live in a society, an era, where we're very privileged to think about having our life to a level that is just beyond living. Mm -hmm. I think we're sufficient enough that our focus in life is to elevate the quality of our lives, not thinking about the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, sustainable routines. So the fact that we can think about the quality of death, I believe, is a sign that our generation, you know, wants to ele elevate their quality to the next level. And that's definitely, I feel, like a luxury these days, given the geopolitical situation. Yes. We're seeing a lot of youth out in Israel and mm -hmm. with the Israel-Hamas war, a lot of just sacrificed innocent lives out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And I think that's why our generation is so fixated on the concept of well dying, mm -hmm. because right now, that's the luxury we can enjoy. Uh, yep. for mm -hmm. countries that aren't at war. Now, Kim, would you like to elaborate on why you think our generation is so keen on well dying? And also, could you add on on what you think it means to have a good death? Mm, I think um, we've all come to realize the inevit inevitability of death. Mm -hmm. So instead of avoiding it, hoping that it wouldn't happen to us, mm -hmm. I think just accepting it in a mature manner and at the same time reminding ourselves again how important life is because at the end of the day, you only have one life right. to live sure. and you don't have a second chance mm. when it comes to death. And with me, like the concept of having a, do, having a good death is for me, it, it's like I think other than living a very <laughs> fruitful life, mm -hmm. happy life to the fullest, um, signing an advanced medical directive, uh, AMD, oh. in advance to reduce the pain and suffering of death, not only to myself, but to the family that's going to be around me right. during my, that process. So. I think that could be one example of mm -hmm. well dying. And also, also, I mentioned this before, signing up to be an organ donor yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. That can be a bit more meaningful in the midst of all the grief and loss. Mm. What about you, Cheska? How would you define a good wow, death? That is such a multi-leveled mm -hmm. question. Um, you know, I recently attended a photo exhibit by an LA photographer called Andrew George. And what he did was he took photos of terminally ill patients and how they would prepare death. And in the exhibition, there was a foreword by a very famous writer, Alan de Botton, mm -hmm. and he said this quote, death refashions our passion. Mm -hmm. Like it reorients something in us that we have never thought about before because it makes us realize that there are things that are important to us we thought were important, mm -hmm. that does not become important when we're faced with death. And, you know, it leads us to attach new value to things that we hardly would have ever thought of. And for me, I think that's something that possibly good death 
good, quote unquote, good death would be that it almost makes us confront things right. that we otherwise wouldn't. It almost makes us become like superheroes because yeah. there is an end. So we can try things. We we don't want to have any regrets. Right. So I think in a way it empowers us almost. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's a very compelling argument there. And we asked a very similar question to our viewers on what they think is good death. So take a look at the screen to find out what three of them had to say. Let's start with Obiki. I think that passing in a way where you have no regrets, have lived your life to the fullest you possibly can, and feel like you've secured everything for your future generation is the best way to pass. Terrace Bell said, I'm not afraid of death, but my ideal way of dying is silently drifting away in my sleep after living a fulfilling life, whether it be long or short. Shagareth said, dying well means I get to choose when and how I go. Good morphine dosage, nice scotch, some cigarettes, <laughs> and surrounded by loved ones will be enough. I'd hate to lie in bed half comatose waiting for death to come. That just seems like an undesirable way to go. So passive. Now that's what our viewers had to say, but now let's hear what a psychology expert thinks about millennials and Gen Z's growing interest for this concept of well dying. To find out why our generation is more prone to the concept of well dying and proactively seeking ways to better prepare ourselves for the deathbed, we're going to include a psychology expert in our talks. It's Ian Dung, who is an intern counselor from You and Me Psychological and Counseling Services here in Seoul. Welcome, Ian Dung. Hello, thank you for having me. Hello. Our pleasure. Now, Ian Dung, could you give us your own diagnosis to why our generation seems to be so interested in the concept of well dying? Um, I think it's helpful to take a look at the characteristics of our generation to understand why we are so interested in well dying. Um, I think one of the characteristics of our generation, the MCers, is that we seek meaning in everything. Uh, we tend to break the norms and find a true purpose and meaning of life to seek happiness. Uh, when you start seeking the answers to what is the meaning of life, um, I think it eventually reaches the thought of what kind of life do I want to live? Um, and there is no greater motivation uh, for life than facing the fact that there is death at the end. Wow. Um, it is a way to find the purpose of meaning and redefine one's values. Um, I think the passion for finding the purpose of life and the happiness is what drives the young generation to have an interest in well dying. You know, it's no question that death is such a scary and foreign concept to all of us that are living. Um, would you, in your opinion, preparing for death sort of healthier than avoiding the issue or being afraid of thinking about it? And more, more specifically, I actually did the death trial. Do you think taking these pictures for a funeral in advance and trying out these deathbed experience is good for our mental health or something that you would recommend? Um, yeah, definitely, um, because death is a natural life process. Um, no one can avoid it. Mm -hmm. So rather than being avoidant or afraid of it, um, accepting death gives an individual more strength in life because you're fully accepting life. Um, but it, I think it is also important to be aware of the fear of the unknown. Um, the death uh, that is very also natural. Um, so by experiencing well dying activities like designing your own funeral, um, taking pictures in advance, I think these things can help an individual to face the unknown and think about what they're really afraid of. Um, it's a, a good opportunity to address the fear of the unknown. Okay, um, my question is, what would, what would be the best way mentally to practice well dying? Um, ironically, when we think about well dying, it is directly linked to well being in the present moment. Mm. So, taking care of oneself here and now is the best way to practice well dying. Um, knowing your own life values and goals, and how would you like to design your own life? And knowing how you can do that is part of a well dying. 
So I want to introduce three questions that is um, often asked in the hospice care. Um, the first one is, how would you like to die? A very direct question, but it kind of gives you an idea of how do I really want to die? Um, the second one is, do you have any regrets? Um, third one is, anything unsaid to the loved ones? So these questions can help individuals to think about death and life at the same time, uh, reframe their life values and focus on the life that you're living right now. Um, I think we need to talk about death more in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. uh, so fully accepting life by accepting death is the best way to practice while dying. And John, I can't agree with you anymore because death, though it seems to be a very distant concept, especially for our generation, given that we are quite young, I think it's something that we need, we need to be accepting and talking about so we know how to better facilitate healthier discussions. Thank you so much, Injong. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and let's wrap up today's episode by practicing what Injong told us to do to practice well dying, and that's by thinking of do we have any unsaid comments to our loved ones? So, Kihun, what would your last word of advice or <gasps> so of wisdom be, <laughs> given that you're on your deathbed? Kihun, you've got the tears ready. <laughs> I mean, it's a tough question because it's Beautiful not going to happen to us, happen to me right now. But you never know what's going to yeah. happen with mm -hmm. life. But there are many famous quotes and things that I would like to say uh, when I'm in that moment. But I like to keep things simple in life mm -hmm. and just say live with no regrets mm, that's what no i like regrets. to say yeah all right what about you cheska you know when you asked me that question i had this like pang in my heart i think you know i use this analogy of marathon we run the marathon to set our best records right we don't run just to run and i kind of think about that too although it might sound really pessimistic some people i think we live eventually to die at our best record mm -hmm. so i think my last word though would be to say all my loved ones forget me now mm. for i have lived yeah forget me now for i have lived yeah and over the past mm. two days we've been talking about death and how our generation perceives it and hopefully it isn't to bring out those pessimistic <laughs> vibes this is very optimistic yeah actually it, it is for us yeah. to better shed light on the fact that we are well aware of death and we're willing to accept it Absolutely. and we're hoping to fa facilitate healthier discussions right. on how we can better accept it but in the meantime, we'll be here every day from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks to Cheska Daino. Pleasure is always mine. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. All right. And thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We are News, News Generation. Generation. Welcome to Within the Frame. This program is a dynamic news talk program that delves into foreign policy, the global economy, and various aspects of life and culture. With expert analysis, you can stay well informed and engaged with today's most pressing global issues. Diplomat Talks. 
uncover how diplomats forge lasting connections and work together with other nations in diplomat talks. Listening to diverse viewpoints and meeting global leaders, you can get an in-depth understanding of today's current issues in Korea and the world. Gain exclusive insights from interviews with ambassadors and get acquainted with different countries around the globe. One day, one Korea. Want to discover the heart of Korea? One Day, One Korea presents a daily cultural series that brings viewers to everyday Korean life. Explore impactful figures in socio-cultural fields, enjoy great movies and delicious food, and last but not least, the vibrant performances. Simply K-Pop Contour Calling all K-Pop fans the world over. Get ready to dive into the fantastic music realm on Simply K-Pop Contour. Watch breathtaking performances by your favorite idols and show your support by participating